Now the honourable member for Saanich Gulf Islands. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and it's an honour to rise today to support Bill C-48 to legislate a permanent tanker ban along British Columbia's north coast. I also have amendments that I hope we can still pass. I brought them, to, brought them before the committee. But I find the debate about this tanker ban to uh, take place, as often happens, in, in a sort of a miasma of um, amnesia. Uh, it's important for Canadians to know that we're now legislating a tanker ban that was honored and in effect from 1972 until Stephen Harper chose to imagine it away. From 1972 until at least 2012, every federal government and every provincial government had accepted, as did our courts, that there was a moratorium against crude oil tankers along BC's north coast and particularly in the Hecate Strait, Dixon Entrance, Queen Charlotte Sound. So just for the purposes of giving us our bearings, I want to revisit how that tanker ban came to be in effect and the implications today when we look at data about the safety of transiting BC's north coast, the importance of recognizing that the tanker ban was in place from 1972 uh, until, as I said, Stephen Harper chose to ignore it. Now, that tanker ban was put in place in 1972 by former Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau. And it was as a result of an immediate threat to the BC North Coast, primarily from a proposed expansion of oil tanker traffic from Alaska to the Juan de Fuca Strait. Now, there was a backbencher in the Liberal ranks who went on to become our Minister of Fisheries, Minister of Environment, and so on. But at that point, David Anderson was a backbencher from a riding that wasn't yet called Victoria, but that's where, where he was. Uh, I think it was called Esquimalt uh, Saanich at the time. But in any case, David Anderson was the backbencher MLA, who was also simultaneously involved with environmental groups in a lawsuit in the U.S. to try to get the newly minted National Environmental Policy Act on the U.S. side of the border to have a mandatory, thorough environmental review of the threat of Alaska oil tanker traffic down to Juan de Fuca and what that would mean for the BC North Coast. Uh, David Anderson, Liberal MLA, went to Pierre Trudeau, Liberal Prime Minister, and put it to him that the case to protect the North Coast of BC depended quite a lot on Canada federally exerting that we wouldn't put our tankers through there either. It was important for the legal case south of the border. It was important in principle. Now, why would we figure, I mean, I, I would like to see a, a tanker ban on any tanker carrying Dilbit, because as my honor, other honorable colleagues have already pointed out, there is no technology to clean up Dilbit. But I want to hold our attention for a moment on what was happening in 1972. I know a lot of honorable members are not from the BC coast, but if you look at a map, you'll see why this area is particularly important not to have any oil tanker traffic. And I also get questions from people, you know, being originally from Cape Breton, I get people say, well, why, why isn't there a tanker ban on the Atlantic coast? Why did it only happen on the BC coast? It's all about the specifics of an extremely turbulent, active ocean in those places and the presence offshore of a landmass. So any spill that occurred it, but along between the Hecate Strait and Dixon Entrance and Queen Charlotte Sound would create an oil spill that not only di didn't float out to sea, it would go back and forth between striking the coasts of uh, Haida Gwaii, which we then called uh, the Queen Charlotte Islands, backing up to hit the coast of British Columbia. It was a specific geographical threat that continues to this day it's the most active ocean currents. I think it's the second most action, o, active ocean current on the planet, according to Environment Canada data from the time. So David Anderson was able to convince Pierre Trudeau to put in place a tanker ban. It stayed in place from 1972 till 2012. Now, what's the significance of that? It means that every time people proposing oil tanker traffic along our coast point to the safety and the safety record, the safety record has something to do with the fact that we have not allowed crude oil tankers through those waters since 1972. That has something to do with a great record of not having had oil spills. We don't allow the oil tankers there. 
We haven't since 1972. This piece of legislation does what the Liberals promised. And despite broken promises by the Liberals, and I, I heard my honorable colleague uh, making the suggestion, uh, my colleague from Carlton Trail, Eagle Creek, that they break so many promises, why not break this one too? I don't want to go in that direction. I want to thank them and approve and applaud when they keep a promise. This is an important promise. It's a legislative tanker ban that meets the goals of decades of commitment to protect those northern waters. And what particularly important nation are we also protecting? The Haida Nation. You talk about how First Nations were consulted. There were extensive consultations before the 1972 tanker moratorium. And particularly, the Haida Nation, which had the most at stake, as well as coastal nations on the other side uh, along the mainland of Canada. But the Haida Nation has been consistent for decades that they don't want tankers in their territorial waters. And the Haida Nation is right. The threat is far too dangerous. Crude oil along that coastline would despoil traditional fishing, not to mention tourism, other economic benefits. So this is not a tanker ban that came out of the blue. That's my main point up to this point in my speech so far, Madam Speaker. This is not something that the current Prime Minister invented for an election platform. This is fulfilling a commitment that was made in 1972 and finally giving it legal teeth. Now, it could be better. There's no question about that. Uh, we, for instance, have had spills that were devastating from much smaller vessels that will still be allowed under this ban. So, as everyone knows, the, uh, the, the really disastrous spill, but it was relatively, it was certainly well below the limit that will be allowed under this bill, of the Nathan Stewart running aground in Bella Bella. Huge impact for the health sick nation. Chief Marilyn Slut has described it as a complete disaster for that nation, for that community, for those waters and those species. And that was uh, well below the 12,500 12, tons that is permissible under this bill. Uh, would, would, I would really prefer to see a 2,000 ton threshold that was actually initially in the Transport Canada uh, discussion paper that was put forward. It was widely supported to hold it to a 2,000 threshold ton level. It is true that in the outer waters, those U.S. tankers can still move, but that's the point. We're protecting the internal, historically significant internal waters of Canada that have been protected since 1972. And the other impact, of course, of having had this moratorium for so long is that the, the waters there have been protected from crude oil, but in the intervening time since 1972, we now have a different product, an entirely different product, proposed for shipment. Now, the different product is bitumen mixed with diluent. And bitumen mixed with diluent cannot be cleaned up. That's the best scientific advice we have in Canada from numerous studies that have been peer reviewed that bitumen, which is a solid, is only mixed in with diluent to make it flow through a pipeline. So it's a unique um, carrying mechanism. It's not a product. Bitumen is the product. The diluent is added only to make it flow through a pipeline. And it really cannot be overstated in this place so that members who are not as deeply immersed as many of us from British Columbia are in the multitude of reasons why the Kinder Morgan pipeline expansion is not a good idea for Canada. Uh, bitumen mixed with diluent cannot be cleaned up. The diluent, which is a fossil fuel condensate like naphtha, including butane and, and benzene, is added in and stirred just to make the solid material uh, bitumen flow through a pipeline. At the other end, it gets loaded onto a tanker at the other end of the tanker traffic, wherever it goes, to a refinery in some other country, taking jobs in Canada with it, away from refineries in Canada, they then have to get the diluent away. You have to pull diluent out of the material because it isn't commercially valuable to them at that point. Then they're back to solid bitumen. Then they have to upgrade the solid bitumen and put it through a refinery. The Oceans Protection Plan is still not a plan. As one of my constituents, the Honorable Pat Carney, former Minister of Energy, says, it's an Oceans Protection wish list. You'd like to see a plan. We still don't know. We know it's a $1.5 billion promise. We don't know how many billion million they're supposed to be spent on Pacific, how many million Arctic Ocean, how many Pacific BC Ocean. We don't know. So, Madam Speaker, as we look at Bill C-48, I still hope to see amendments to be more protective of our coastline. 
I will vote for Bill C-48, and I will defend Bill C-48 as the continuation of a tanker ban we've had in place since 1972. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Questions and comments? The R member for uh, Kootenai, Columbia. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I'd like to thank my colleague for her, uh, I guess, historical perspective as well as uh, very timely perspective today. Uh, there's been some talk about governments, whether it be the Alberta government or the federal government, bailing out uh, this Texas-owned pipeline uh, to the point of several billions of dollars. I've heard anywhere from $2 billion to $9 billion. I wonder if she can comment on what uh, taxpayers might think is a better use if government was going to invest between 2 and $9 billion in the oil industry. The Honourable Member for Sandwich Gulf Islands. Well, and thank you to my friend from Kootenai, Columbia. Uh, it's, it's absolutely astonishing that the federal government would consider giving any money whatsoever to a Houston-based pipeline company with uh, not a, a very, very dubious uh, record for environmental performance. It is, by the way, Richard Kinder, the founder, was the vice president of Enron. Uh, almost a, a good number of the executives of Kinder Morgan are alumni of, of Enron that, went to, that was, uh, of course, found historically guilty of fraud and scam and con games galore. Richard Kinder found himself uh, not in jail, like some of his colleagues at the end of the Enron disaster, and owning Enbridge, rather en Enron Pipelines Limited. Enron Pipelines Limited became Kinder Morgan, and they bought Trans Mountain, another company run by a Canadian company, Trans Mountain, from the early 50s. That's another historical glitch that Kinder Morgan has appropriated the safety record of a different company shipping a different product from the 1950s. So there are there are there is no worse way to spend federal public revenue than giving it to Kinder Morgan. Questions and comments? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary, the Government House Leader. Yes, thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. And uh, one of the election commitments that the, this government made uh, in the lead up to October was the fact that we would bring in uh, a moratorium. And understanding and appreciation today, uh, the, the public uh, opinions and desire is to see a, a government, to, in fact, uh, deal with our oceans and how we can protect them. And whether it's the investment of literally hundreds of millions in terms of the future protection of our oceans or the moratorium, that these are, in fact, a commitment to fulfill a promise uh, to Canadians. And I'm wondering if the, uh, my colleague from Crossway can just provide her thoughts on why these are important uh, commitments. The RO member for Sandwich Gulf Islands. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Madam Speaker, and certainly to my honourable friend from Winnipeg. It's important to keep every promise. The f democracy is fragile, and many Canadians, many voters in democracies around the world, uh, have a declining level of respect for people like us because they watch politicians make promises and they get into office and they break them. Every single broken promise is a gamble with the future of democracy. Will the voter who believed the promise? that 2015 will be the last election held under first past the post, feel like voting again with that being a broken promise. So every promise matters, and I think keeping this promise, legislating the tanker ban for the northern BC coast, is one that is historic, significant, and without any partisan spin whatsoever, I thank the government, the Prime Minister, Minister of Transportation, for bringing this in. And please go back to keeping some of the other promises.